Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Len Gordon. I have the privilege of leading the advertising and marketing group here at Venable. We're presenting a webinar today discussing the FTC's ambitious rulemaking agenda. In many ways, it seems as if we're going back to the future with uh, the FTC engaging in a, a wide variety of very aggressive rulemaking. That was how the FTC operated in the 1970s, and many people think that conduct almost led to the end uh, of the agency. So it's a, a very interesting time, an awful lot going on. I am joined today by my colleagues, Mary Gardner and Mike Munoz. We have a lot to cover, so I will let, let's get it started. Mike, you wanna move the slides forward, please? So we're going to start by talking. We're going to start today by talking about the FTC's renewed attention to its rulemaking authority and to bringing enforcement actions um, for rule violations. And this all comes back to um, a unanimous op opinion from the Supreme Court in 2021, AMG Capital. Most of you have heard us talk about this case before. It was a huge, pivotal turning point in the FTC's enforcement authority. In AMG, the Supreme Court ruled that the FTC is not entitled to recover equitable monetary relief from defendants when it proceeds under Section 13B of the Federal Trade Commission Act. Now, prior to the Supreme Court's ruling in AMG, Section 13B was the FTC's favored enforcement tool because it allowed the FTC to file civil lawsuits on its own behalf, not through the Department of Justice, against defendants for a wide array of unfair and deceptive practices, and to recover very large sums of money for those violations. Um, to date, Congress hasn't passed a bill to fill the void. They haven't amended Section 13B to allow for monetary remedies. There have been numerous bills, but none of them have, have proceeded very far. And that's despite the FTC's pretty vocal and public pleas to Congress to, to, to fill the void. So the FTC has been forced to look to different avenues to shore up the aggressive enforcement agenda that Chair Khan has indicated she intends to pursue in the consumer protection space. And one such avenue is to file more enforcement actions under the FTC's Section 19 authority. And that's the, the FTC's enforcement tool to pursue rule violations, as well as certain statutory violations, such as the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act. Now, going back to the one -on -one, 101 on this, Congress grants the FTC authority to act. And so if we want to look at the FTC's enforcement authority under Section 19, we have to go back to the plain language of the statutes that Congress enacted. And this is the relevant sections of Section 19. And you can see here that under Section 19, which in the US Code is 57B, Congress granted the FTC authority to file suit, again, on its own behalf, for any rule violation, provided the rule goes to unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Now, the second bullet point we have here is the relief that a court can grant the FTC for a Section 19 rule violation. And as you can see, it's, while it's relatively broad, it includes monetary damages, public notification, changes to contracts. It explicitly calls out that the FTC is not entitled to any exemplary or punitive damages. Now, later in this presentation, we're gonna be walking through some recent Rule 19 enforcement actions, and we're gonna see exactly how far the FTC is trying to press and expand the scope of the relief it's entitled to under Section 19. So just keep this language in the back of your head for that. Next slide. But even before AMG was decided, there were discussions and advocacy at the FTC uh, really spearheaded by then Commissioner Chopra, who is now the head of the CFPB, 
publicly ad advocating for an increased use of the FTC's rulemaking authority to obtain civil monetary penalties. And this Section 45M, which is Section 5M of the FTC Act, sets forth the standard to obtain civil monetary penalties for certain rule violations. And as you can see here, it has two, two main requirements. One is that there be a violation of a rule regarding an unfair or deceptive act or practice. And the second, which you can see bolded, is there has to be either actual knowledge or knowledge fairly implied. Now, procedurally, this is a more difficult hurdle for the FTC than a plain Rule 19 case. And that's because the FTC can't just run into federal court under Section 5M. They have to first send the penalty complaint to the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice then has 45 days to decide whether to pursue the complaint. If they don't, they kick it back to the FTC and the FTC can then proceed on its own behalf uh, in the civil action. The other interesting thing about this section is the knowledge requirement. And there's really no strong case law explaining what actual knowledge or knowledge fairly implied means. But when you think about it from a, take a step back from a, a plain language perspective, you can say, it might not be difficult to demonstrate that for well-known rules or very narrow rules, but this standard could prove to be a real challenge if rules like the broad proposed earnings rule claim actually come to fruition. We may see some ability to really put up good defenses um, for those bro any broad new, new rules or or if the FTC puts forth an unusual interpretation of a rule. So that's something for to pay attention to as we talk more about rulemaking developments. Two other real quick Thanks, points Mary. on that. Mike, just two other real quick points on that. Um, mm -hmm. Sam Levine, who wrote that article with Commissioner, then Commissioner Chopra, is now the director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection. So his views on this aren't just of academic interest. I mean, he's now running the Bureau. So that, that's important to keep in mind. And the penalties. So what are the civil penalties? They're in excess of $45,000 per violation. So if you're talking about that on a transaction basis where you're dealing with thousands of transactions, you're dealing essentially with statutory damages uh, times transactions and the numbers can get ginormous in a hurry. Okay, Mike. Thanks, Len. Um, so Mary just talked us through uh, some of the enforcement mechanisms that the FTC has for rule violations. But let's take a step back now and uh, get an understanding of how the FTC uh, gets these rules. The FTC has several ways to promulgate rules, and we'll talk about some of those distinctions uh, between the two ways of the FTC promulgating rules. The first is rulemaking under the Administrative Procedure Act, or frequently referred to as notice and comment rulemaking. Uh, how this works is uh, in the colloquial name. First, the FTC publishes a notice that, uh, of the proposed rule, and, allow, and second, it allows uh, the uh, public to comment on the proposed rule and then third, after reviewing the commentary, the FTC can promulgate the final rule. Now, it's very important to remember here is that the FTC has a very limited ability to promulgate rules under the APA. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why in a second, but Congress must specifically authorize in another statute that the FTC has the authority to promulgate rules by way of notice and comment. Some examples are listed here, which Congress has authorized the FTC to engage in APA rulemaking. The first of which being uh, the TSR was that prohibits deceptive or abusive telemarketing acts is authorized by the Telemarketing and Consumer Fraud and Abuse Prevention Act, which clearly states that the commission shall prescribe rules prohibiting deceptive telemarketing acts or practices and other abusive telemarketing acts or practices. 
The second of which being the Children's Online Privacy Protection Rule, which prohibits unfair, deceptive acts or practices regarding collection or use of children's personal information on the internet. That's authorized by COPPA, uh, which says that the commission shall promulgate rules and regulations requiring website operators to make certain disclosures, obtain consent, and maintain reasonable procedures. And finally, the Privacy of Consumer Financial Information Rule uh, governs financial institutions' uh, use of consumer information. That's authorized by the Graham Leach Bliley Act. And that gives the CFPB, the SEC, and the, CF the CFTC, and the FTC uh, authority to prescribe regulations of financial institutions' uh, disclosure of personal information. Now let's compare this with the FTC's other authority to promulgate rules. The FTC also has the authority under Section 18 of the FTC Act, also known as the Magnuson Moss Warranty Federal Trade Commission's Improvement Act of 1975 to promulgate more broader trade regulations. This MagMoss rulemaking authority, it's significantly more cumbersome than APA rulemaking that I talked about earlier. And it stand, as it stands today, it has a number of steps that the FTC has to go through before final rules promulgated. First, the FTC must issue an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, this doesn't contain the text of the rule, but it notifies the public that the FTC is interested in regulating a certain area. Uh, the advance notice solicits public comment and typically lists a number of questions that uh, the FTC uh, seeks more information on uh, to craft the rule. Then the, F the FTC moves to the notice of proposed rulemaking, which it's required uh, to give 30 days notice to the uh, oversight committees in Congress before it uh, publishes the notice. Uh, the proposed rule must contain evidence that defines with specificity the acts or practices that are unfair and deceptive, uh, and that such acts are prevalent. Following the publication of the proposed rule, the FTC must hold a hearing uh, if any interested parties want request it. Uh, the hearing is run by the presiding officer that notes any disputes of material fact, and the hearing, uh, the presiding officer allows for cross examination and any rebuttal testimony, and then submits a report to the commission with a recommended resolution of these disputes based on the record. After that, the agency can proceed to a final rule consistent with the rulemaking record. And what's important, we'll talk about more later, is the MAGMOS Act provides for uh, ju uh, enhanced judicial review threshold where a court can invalidate a rule if it's not based on substantial evidence. So with that, Len's going to talk some more about some of the FTC's rulemaking. So. Thanks, Mike. So section 6G of the FTC Act has been in there almost since its inception. It provides that from time to time, the agency can classify corporations and make rules and regulations for the purpose of carrying out the provisions of the F FTC Act. And historically, the FTC viewed that provision as authorizing it to make both uh, competition rules and consumer protection rules. Meg Moss was meant to sort of both enhance and limit the FTC's rulemaking ability on consumer protection, which left the question, what happened to the competition rulemaking uh, ability? Um, there is a very vigorous debate going on about whether that authority survives Magnus and Moss. Some folks believe that because Congress specifically uh, delineated the circumstances under which the FTC could uh, promulgate rules for the consumer protection mission. If it wanted the agency to continue to promulgate rules on the competition mission, it would have done so. Others argue that because the uh, Congress didn't specifically uh, strip the competition rulemaking, it, it survives. Um, there are also gonna be issues about how much of that competition rulemaking survives in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision in the West Virginia versus EPA case, but we can um, talk about that a little bit further. But this, this is an area where 
the commission is uh, considering it. It's not clear exactly what, if anything, they're going to do yet. There, there are certainly some areas where they've thought about it. And there was even talk originally that the, the privacy rulemaking that we'll talk about in a few minutes might be done under the competition of uh, rulemaking procedures to avoid the cumbersome MAGMOS procedures that, that Mike just talked about. Um, we, can, we can move forward to the next slide. And actually we can probably, I think I've covered this. We can go to the, the, his, the historical segments, Mike. Thanks, Len. So the FTC's authority to promulgate rules and their uh, actual promulgation of rules has substantially changed over time. In the last 40 years and up until recently, the FTC has largely been dormant with respect to promulgating new rules under MAGMOS. And a historical view of MAGMOS really underlines uh, why that is. So MAGMOS, as I mentioned, was initially enacted in 1975, and the FTC really put its authority to quick use, passing a number of rules in the late 70s. At one point, the FTC went 15 and 15, passing, issuing 15 rules in 15 months uh, that governed a wide variety of topics. Here we have some examples of rules that, that the FTC passed in the late 70s, uh, one being the labeling and advertising of home insulation rules. Uh, that still exists and has been amended over the years. The vocational schools rule uh, was passed to alleviate abusive practices against vocational home school, vocational and homeschool students and prospective students. And what's interesting about that rule is uh, it required uh, more onerous refund policies even though the FTC found in its rulemaking process that, it, that existing refund policies weren't necessarily unfair or deceptive. Uh, the, set, the Second Circuit eventually uh, struck down the rule in 1979 for failing to specify that the acts or practices governed by the rule were uh, unfair or deceptive. And finally, we have here uh, a proposed rule that the FTC sought to pass the advertising for over-the-counter antacids rule, uh, which would have required all FDA warnings and disclosures that are on the labels of antacids to be on all of the advertising of antacids. And the, the FTC's prolific rulemaking really came to an apex in, the, in 1978 after a campaign known as KidVid. Essentially, the FTC spearheaded a uh, campaign to uh, protect children from exploitation of television advertising. Uh, one proposed KidVid rule would have resulted in the ban of most, if not all, of children's telev television advertising. This included a ban of all television ads directed or seen by children, directed to or seen by children too young to understand the purpose of advertising. This also included a ban on TV ads seen by children uh, for foods that pose a serious dental health risk. And finally, the KidVid rule uh, requires that ads seen by children not included in that food ban uh, disclose the nutritional and, health, nutritional and health facts of the foods that are being advertised. And what's interesting here is that the FTC premised its rulemaking on a then more nebulous unfairness standard uh, instead of the more brighter line deception standard. For example, in an administrative proceeding in the late 70s, the FTC challenged an ad for a doll that had washable hair. And uh, it argued that because it depicted a child using an electrical hair dryer next to a sink, it was unfair to induce children to engage in unsafe behavior. So as a result of the FTC efforts uh, pursuant to Mag Moss, uh, the Washington Post famously dubbed the FTC the national nanny. And um, at some point, Congress even allowed the agency's funding to lapse, uh, resulting in uh, uh, the agency being shut down for a brief time. But in 1980, Congress eventually intervened and passed the FTC Improvements Act, 
which imposed some of the procedural requirements I discussed earlier for MAGMOS rulemaking, in addition to, of course, prohibiting ch children's advertising rulemaking under that unfairness theory without express congressional approval. So though MAGMOS lays out the steps for uh, the FTC must undertake to promulgate a rule, Len will talk to us some more about how the FTC uh, can and has tinkered with uh, some of the procedural requirements of MAGMOS rulemaking. And before that, um, I have your CLE code. The CLE code is rulemaking 2022. That is rulemaking 2022. Thanks, Mike. Go to the next slide, please. So when Lena Khan took over the agency, I think most observers of the agency will say that she has centralized control of the agency's agenda and operations in the chairman's office to a degree that was somewhat unprecedented. For a long time, there was a ban on agency personnel speaking. And that centralization of control also in the chairman's office also is reflected in revisions that were made to the FTC's internal rules about how it would conduct a MAGMOS rulemaking. Those changes were condemned harshly by the Republican commissioners who felt that the rule changes were uh, done quickly, that they weren't given sort of fair opportunity to comment, and that the rule the procedural changes would lead to rules that would likely get challenged because there was not substantial evidence behind them and the, the process really started to, to lack the kind of independence and the kind of uh, vigorous process that Meg Moss intended. And so we can talk about those a little bit. And you will you will see a recurring theme here. So the the process previously put a lot of the uh, running of the proceedings that would develop the record that would support the rulemaking in the hands of the chief administrative law judge of the FTC. That now is, sits with the uh, FTC chair or her designee. Similarly, the agenda was previously set by the ALJ as a presiding officer. Now the commissioner, the chairman or her designee sets that agenda. Next slide. The MAGMOS rule, uh, procedures require you know, development of a record so that the rule can, is supported by substantial evidence. And that means that you know, there may be disputes of fact. Um, previously, the ALJ finalized what disputes of fact there were. Now that's done by the commission or the chairman. Previously, the staff uh, needed to publish a report that uh, interested parties would see highlighting the impact of the proposed rule, both um, in reining in conduct that needed to be reined in and, and perhaps collateral consequences of that rule as well. Um, no more. Now the omniscient commission uh, will uh, figure this out without um, the need for staff to bother with a report. So again, you, you really see a consolidation of this in the, the commission, but most particularly in the chair's office. Next slide, Mike. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what's going on with this, this rulemaking and I'll uh, turn it over to Ms. Gardner. Thanks, Len. So the proposed earnings claim, this is a recent example of the FTC flexing its renewed MAGMOS rulemaking authority. In February 2022, the FTC unanimously approved the issuance of an advance notice of proposed rulemaking regarding false, misleading, and unsubstantiating, unsubstantiated earnings claims. Now, going back to what Mike said, the AMPR doesn't include the text of the proposed rule, but it does include questions that allow us to ascertain what the FTC is potentially interested in regulating through this proposed rulemaking. And, and some of those areas include the, the use of disclaimers on earnings claims, limiting the use of testimonials, and 
the need for some specific guidance for the necessary level of sub substantiation for this type of claim. Now, in a press release announcing the advance notice, Chair Khan specifically called out some industries that she'd like regulated by this rule, including multi-level marketing, the multi-level marketing industry, gig platforms, and for-profit education. And some of you may be thinking, well, doesn't the FTC already regulate earnings claims? Yes, there's, there's some narrowly tailored rules, including the franchise rule, the telemarketing sales rule, and the business opportunity rule that already regulate certain types of earnings claims. This would be significantly broader. And you know, the, the FTC is not you know, really hiding. It's one of its main um, incentives for wanting to put forth this new rule. They've specifically stated that a key purpose of this rulemaking is to enable the FTC to get mon monetary relief for violations of the FTC Act involving earnings claims in the wake of the AMG decision. And I think you know, the, the Chamber of Commerce before the, the comment period closed in May 2022, the Chamber of Commerce submitted comments and Pardon me, I'm going to read off my notes here, but they had a really good goal that I think really sums up why this may be an improper use of rulemaking. The commission should undertake this kind of broad economy-wide rulemaking only in response to identified widespread unfair and deceptive practices in the market, not in the service of a narrow goal of unlocking remedies. That's something to keep in mind as, as we're watching this move forward. Now, this is not a done deal, you know, uh, assuming the FTC decides to move forward with the rulemaking, it still has to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking that includes the proposed rules text for additional comments, at which point interested parties would have the opportunity to comment and the rest of the MAGMOS proceeding would continue. But this is really something that could have a really broad ranging impact and is worth keeping an eye on. Now, looking at the other side of the coin, in April, the commission unanimously approved a notice of proposed rulemaking and an advance notice of proposed rulemaking regarding the telemarketing sales rule. Now, this is not MAGMOS rulemaking. This is the more traditional APA notice and comment rulemaking. So the, the, the NPR, is seeking comments on whether the F whether the current exemption for telemarketing calls to businesses should be withdrawn or narrowed, as well as regarding some of the record keeping requirements. But the advance notice is is a is a really is seeking uh, comments on some really interesting topics, including the potential applicability applicability to tech support scams as well as whether telemarketers should have to give consumers notice if they're going to be billed for a negative option, like a subscription, and whether they should have to provide a cancellation mechanism like a click to cancel. So it's, that's another one to really keep, keep in mind. And Len, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mary. So the commission, um, has announced a notice of proposed rulemaking on, focused on the automotive industry. The commission was specifically authorized to conduct this rulemaking in, in Dodd-Frank. It took them a while to get there, obviously. And the issues here are very sort of typical FTC section five issues. And I think sort of what, what prompted them to finally act after, after so long was, as you keep hearing, the the loss of their remedial authority after AMG. And the, the issues here regarding junk fees and bait and switch advertising tactics, which sometimes are also referred to as dark patterns, um, are things that you're seeing across many segments of the economy, but the FTC rulemaking here would focus on, you know, misrepresenting vehicle costs, 
financing, purchasing, or leasing terms, and the availability of vehicles at advertised prices require clear and conspicuous disclosure on offering prices and any add-on products or services. Prohibiting dealers from charging for add-ons that prohibit no benefit are undisclosed or are not selected, you know, duplicate warranty coverage, certain coatings, things like that. Uh, need a disclosure of any add-ons that you're, you're buying, so I think it's sort of snuck in there and requiring uh, a lot of record keeping from dealers uh, to sort of allow the commission to go back in and drill down or take this, you know, pre-complaint discovery to make sure that dealers are um, abiding by the rule. I mean, the commission has been active in, in a couple of cases in the last few years on automotive finance and are particularly focused on these kinds of issues when you're dealing with um, people who first language may not be English or people who have limited means for whom the purchase or lease of an automobile is um, an, an enormous financial consequence. So I think that's where you'll see the enforcement here. And with that, let's go to the, the privacy rulemaking. So this is, I think by far the, the most important of, of the rulemakings that the commission is undertaking, at least so far. Um, it has the, the potential to dramatically change the economy and especially the advertising economy. Um, the commission was urged to do this uh, by the president in the July 2021 executive order on, on competition. Um, but he specifically called out the FTC to do this kind of a, excuse me, section 18 rulemaking to address uh, unfair data collection and surveillance practices. Um, this could really change how uh, personalized targeted advertising works and uh, the way the economy based on data works, which is, you know, more and more a, a larger and larger portion of, of the economy. Process-wise, the uh, comment period ends in about a week, actually in a week. Um, they recently held a public forum. There was a wide variety of um, views and somewhat hostile, some fair amount of hostility between the two sides on some of these issues. And this is all happening in uh, the same time that there has been uh, some discussion and even some progress on privacy legislation in Congress. Um, we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, there, there's some thought that the rulemaking was a stalking horse to try and prompt uh, folks in Congress to, to act more vigorously in enacting privacy legislation. At least so far, uh, that hasn't worked. But if you look at the AMPR, it's, I mean, the, the, it's sprawling. I don't know how else to call it. I mean, I think there's 95 questions covering a wide variety of issues. There are hints in there about what a rule might look like, but you know, the, the commission has reserved its right to, to go beyond what's in this advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. And it's clear that a lot of the things in there are, it's sort of like a, a trawler net to try and gather as much information as they can on some of these things um, not clear if that's for law enforcement or for legislative recommendations, but, but the AMPR is really unlike anything I think folks have ever seen in its scope. It uh, discusses the FTC's reasons for the rulemaking, which is to consider whether rules on commercial surveillance, so that's what they're, they're calling sort of, you know, the tracking that happens on the internet for advertising, and lax data practices are necessary. They're going to generate a public record on this and create more predictive predictability for consumers and business. Um, I'm not sure that's possible. They want to look at how that is collected and monetized. And they're concerned that consumers have to surrender personal information to participate in the internet. They are concerned about information asymmetries, alleging consumer consent is not necessarily meaningful or informed when consumers give up their data. And they are concerned that there is a broad range of potential harms financial, safety, physical, mental health, potentially discrimination, and more flowing from all these data practices. A, a really, really broad array of things that um, are there. But remember, you know, to, to pass a rule, the FTC is gonna have to find that the practice is prevalent. 
and that's determined by prior cease and desist orders or other information that there's a widespread pattern of unfair deceptive acts or practices. So the rulemaking record here, if this thing ever really gets off the ground, could be enormous. And you would expect that the uh, industry um, that are affected by this, which is an enormous array of industries, will be, will be pushing back on this. And we are. And some of the comments from the Republicans who, who opposed the uh, rulemaking are interesting. I'll be kind. Uh, Commissioner Phillips said the AMPR was a naked power grab that would restructure the internet economy without a con clear congressional mandate. He also said that the AMPR did not meet the requirement to briefly describe the commission's intended area of inquiry and objective. He also noted that the AMPR seeks to regulate conduct beyond the FTC's areas of historical enforcement. And I think there you start talking about uh, areas of discrimination and other things. Commissioner Wilson, who's become the great dissenter at the FTC, um, commented that she hoped the rulemaking will not derail the privacy legislation. And she was also uh, concerned that this type of sprawling uh, rulemaking, when you combine it with the, quote, improvements, close quotes, to the uh, procedures at the FTC, really um, seemed like a recipe for regulatory overreach and was concerned that this would impact the commission's ability to um, do well before Congress as it seeks to get uh, its 13B authority restored and its budget uh, increased. So with that, um, you know, we'll see what actually happens next, but there's a, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, Len. And so the most recent uh, FTC rulemaking action has been um, a notice of proposed rulemaking that the FTC issued with respect to the impersonation of government and businesses rule. Uh, the FTC issued the notice on September 15th and previously issued the advance notice on December 21st of 2021. So that really gives you a sense of how long at least part of this process uh, may, may take for the FTC to issue an advance notice, digest the comments, and then issue a notice with the proposed rule. In, the, in this proposed rule, um, the, the FTC seeks to hit prohibit calling, messaging, or contacting consumers while using a, or while posing as a government or business agent. It also seeks to uh, prohibit sending physical mail or creating a website using government seals or identifying insignias and as well as business logos or business marks. It seeks to prohibit spoofing government or businesses address and also prohibits using government seals or business marks on buildings, websites, emails, or other physical or digital places. What's perhaps most interesting about this proposed rule is that it prohibits someone from providing the means or instrumentalities for a violation, which the ANPR notes that it's different from assisting and facilitating that you'll see in the telemarketing sales rule. The FTC explains that this would impose direct liability for someone who passes on a false or misleading representation with knowledge that a consumer may possibly be deceived. Um, so the one example that they used was someone manufacturing an IRS agent identification badge uh, that would that would violate this means and instrumentalities provision of the proposed rule. Um, in response to the advance notice, the FTC received 140 comments, mostly from individual consumers that support the rule. However, it, it's really interesting to see that. Um, the, 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 the commentary from industry. There were 10 comments from businesses and 11 from industry associations that generally support the rule uh, with several of these comments uh, asking the FTC to ensure that the rule doesn't stifle legitimate business and that nonprofits are included in the definition of businesses, which actually ended up uh, making its way into the definition of business in the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. 
So the, the, on September 15th, the FTC um, announced that it was um, uh, publishing the notice of proposed rulemaking and that once the notice makes its way into the federal register, the comment period is open for 60 days, but we haven't seen this in the federal register as of yet. So in addition to ongoing rulemaking proceedings, we can kind of glean where the FTC might be headed uh, based on some recent policy and guidance updates, uh, which serve as some informal rules uh, that, that the FTC is really focused on. Um, the guides and policy statements that are listed here uh, summarize uh, what the FTC is really passionate about, and they may, they may be good indicators of uh, what more is to come from the FTC as far as rulemaking uh, goes. And so now that we've discussed the FTC's rulemaking efforts, let's take a look at some recent, recent enforcement efforts. Next slide. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. So in August 2021, the FTC's Made in the USA labeling rule took effect. And the rule prohibits claims on the labels and packaging of products, say, stating that the product was made in the United States unless final assembly or processing occurred in the United States or all or virtually all of the ingredients or components were made or sourced in the United States. Importantly, the rule authorizes the FTC to seek civil penalties. Since the rule went into effect, the FTC has brought five cases for alleged violations. Now, all five of these actions have a common component, the aggressive expansion of the plain language of the rule, language that the FTC itself drafted. Specifically in each of these actions, the FTC has made claims that the company violated the made in the USA labeling rule by making false made in the USA claims on websites. So not just on the product label, not just on the product packaging, website claims. So that's, that's a pretty aggressive expansion of the rule that you know, has not been successfully challenged yet. Let's look at one of the five cases just as an example. So matter of resident home. Um, the FTC announced an administrative complaint and a proposed order against resident home and its individual owner uh, alleging that they improperly claimed that their mattresses were made in the USA when they were actually imported from China. The company and the, and the owner agreed to pay 753,000 in damages. That's the highest damages amount under the rule to date. And they also agreed to notify affected customers and they're barred from claiming their products are made in the USA unless they apply with the rule going forward. Now, all of that sounds like it complies with the Section 19 statutory authority we, we talked about when, when we, we started, right? They can get monetary damages, they can have notification requirements, and they have to follow the law. But the commission was, was split on, on whether to approve, with the Republican commissioners Phillips and, and Wilson voting no. And this was all about the amount of damages, the $753,000 monetary figure. And the majority, the three Democratic commissioners, they ultimately agreed on the $753,000 figure, citing the company's status as a repeat offender. Now, in 2018, the predecessor company to Resident Home had entered into a no money, no fault order with the FTC. And so that so the commission, the, the majority commissioners said that the high damages figure was a necessary amount for, again, a repeat offender. Now you might be sitting here and thinking about back to that section 19 slide and saying, oh, I think I remember that there are no punitive damages allowed. This sounds mighty punitive to me. Well, that's what the Republican commissioners thought when they dissented. They said the amount of monetary relief is outside the bounds of the FTC Section 19 authority. If you're punishing someone for being a repeat offender, it's clearly the type of punitive damages that are explicitly 
disallowed under the plain language of the statute. So, you know, uh, I thought interestingly in the dissent, the, minor the minority commissioners reminded the majority, if the FTC continues to flout the limits of its authority, it should fully expect additional rebukes from the courts. I guess I can say we can really only hope so if things like this can continue to happen. And then I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Mary. Um, before I start talking about textiles, one of the things you're also seeing uh, with the FTC in using a Section 19 authority and also the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau when it's seeking restitution or redress are to describe that relief as legal relief, not equitable relief, so as to avoid arguments by defendants that the Supreme Court's decision in the SEC versus Liu, LIU case, um, limits equitable monetary relief really to, to gain um, and, and shouldn't be based on victims' loss. That's, that's a legal remedy. So the um, agencies are listening and, and um, starting to uh, do that. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, one of the significant things about that is who the finder of fact is. If the agencies are seeking legal remedies, the Constitution provides that you're entitled to a jury trial. So um, you know, that may or may not be a good thing for a defendant, depends on your case, but it, it could really change the way these kinds of cases get tried. So with that, let me, let me move to, to fabrics briefly. And the, the Coles case is really an interesting example of sort of how the commission is trying to fill the vacuum created by the AMG case, um, you know, seeking civil penalties for, for violations of the textile rule, um, but also using its penalty offense authority under section 45 M1B, which allows the commission to go after a company if it is um, aware of a prior litigated order by the commission declaring certain conduct to be unfair or deceptive and the company then engages in similar conduct. So here the commission is using both its rule authority and its penalty offense authority to, to get civil penalties. Um, you know, the, the, this is an area where you know, uh, the FTC has been active, going after companies who are advertising fabric says bamboo and natural when they um, contain uh, harsh, when the, the, the product is manufactured using harsh chemicals and frequently um, not just uh, from bamboo. So with that, let me turn it back to Mary um, to talk about TSR enforcement actions. Thanks, Len. Um, so the TSR enforcement actions that we have highlighted here really underscore the relief that the FTC seeks to obtain in uh, not only rule enforcement actions, but TSR enforcement actions. The first case here, USA versus VOIP Terminator, is a prime example about what Mary talked about earlier regarding the FTC's increased use of civil monetary penalties for rule violations. Uh, this case was brought under the FTC's Section 5M1A authority to abstain civil penalties. Uh, this means that the FTC referred the case to the Department of Justice and had the DOJ not taken the case, the FTC could have sought civil penalties on, on its own behalf. So what happened here is the defendant provided telemarketers with voice over internet protocol services, giving them the ability to use the internet to make telemarketing phone calls. What the DOJ alleges is that the defendant assisted and facilitated telemarketing sales rule violations in two ways. The first is that the defendant, the, the DOJ alleges that the defendant knew its customers were not using the DNC scrub list that the defendant provided its customers. And second, that the despite multiple complaints from both uh, state agencies and industry associations, the defendant continued to allow its customers to use its network to make purportedly unlawful telemarketing sales calls. Uh, the, in this case, the defendant stipulated to a pretty hefty judgment uh, for $3.2 million, uh, all of which was in civil penalties. 
The second case we have here, Green Equitable Solutions, involves calls placed to consumers offering uh, mortgage relief assistance. And uh, reportedly, they told consumers that they were associated with government uh, mortgage relief programs. And though this was a TSR case, the allegations in the complaint really allude to what I was talking about earlier, where the FTC is seeking to prohibit uh, under the proposed impersonation rule. The FTC partnered with the California Department of Financial Protection to bring the case. And this is a practice that the FTC has frequently done to obtain monetary relief where it's proceeding under Section 13B to obtain injunctions. Uh, and which Mary told us about earlier, um, they can't obtain monetary relief. So usually they partner with a state agency to work to obtain uh, additional monetary relief. At the outset of the case, the FTC obtained a temporary restraining order from the court, uh, which froze the defendant's assets and also appointed a receivership for the company. And after the parties briefed a preliminary injunction motion, uh, the, court, the court granted that preliminary injunction, which extends the entirety of the asset freeze and the receivership to the conclusion of the case. So this really demonstrates the type of uh, relief, not only monetary, but injunctive that the FTC can obtain for, for rule violations. And this all, all of the discussion today leads us to our final question for today. In the face of the FTC's aggressive effort to expand its enforcement authority through rulemaking, what can impacted companies and individuals do to protect themselves and to, to effectively advocate during the rulemaking process? And one of those areas is the, the comment periods. So as, as Mike explained earlier, you know, both the ANPR and NPR provide comment periods for interested parties. And that's really a place where interested parties can effectively advocate to, to you know, either inform the FTC um, regarding, you know, what they're getting right, alert them to what they're getting wrong, and provide information that can challenge their assumptions when they're inaccurate or to also help them understand what assumptions they should be making instead. And effective comments, they don't just simply state that you support or oppose whatever the proposed rule is. Instead, a strong comment is gonna give additional information, data, experiences, perspective, or arguments. It's going to explain how the rule would positively or negatively affect the interested party's specific situation. And one pro tip in the commenting process, we talked in a few of our, when we were talking about a few of the proposed rulemakings, we talked, we highlighted that there were a number of questions. So Len said, you know, somewhere in the 90s on the, the commercial surveillance and privacy rulemaking, pay attention to those prompts and questions. And to the extent you can, respond to them. That highlight, those prompts, they're highlighting areas that the FTC is really interested in and what they think is important. And so that's more likely to get the attention of the reviewers if you're actually directly responding to those. Now, well-drafted comments, they can, they're not just to help improve rules and to try and prevent bad rules from being finalized. As we're gonna discuss in more detail shortly, well-drafted comments can provide the grounds for a legal challenge to that regulatory overreach that we're starting to see the FTC take on through its rulemaking. Now, Mike's going to talk a little bit more about how you interest in individuals can be heard during the MAGMOS informal hearing process. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, so informal hearings are a good opportunity not only to present your views to the FTC, like Mary was just talking about, but also to explain how your views differ from others that have submitted commentary. If there's disputed issues, uh, it allows you an opportunity to submit rebuttal information and cross-examine others who've submitted commentary. Um, because of the very intricate and nuance of differing views, this may be that may be presented to the commission. Um, it's important to, to navigate 
uh, submitting this rebuttal and cross examine uh, cross examination carefully and strategically. Though the presiding officer can impose limits on the rebuttal information and cross examination that can occur at these informal hearings. Such limits are a basis for a court's review and reversal. So let's dive into this a little more. As you can see here, MAGMOS provides that an interested person can challenge the rule within 60 days of final promulgation in the DC circuit. So the DC circuit can set aside a MAGMOS rule if it's not supported by substantial evidence. This allows the court to either strike down the rule altogether, direct the FTC to consider additional submissions, or set aside the rule if the presiding officer's limitations on the rebuttal or cross-examination process precluded the disclosure of material facts. Since challenges are in the DC circuit, decisions are final and only subject to Supreme Court review. What we can glean from the judicial process here is that uh, it's remarkably a lower burden than APA rulemaking, which only requires the court to find that the rule is arbitrary or capricious versus, as you can see here, the MAGMOS is supported by substantial evidence. And why this is important is because the folks at the Supreme Court have expressed some rather healthy skepticism of agencies trying to increase their rulemaking and regulatory authority. In West Virginia versus EPA, the court struck down using the major question doctrine, EPA's authority to uh, devise emission cap caps under the Clean Air Act. The, under that statute, EPA was granted the authority to set standards for plant emissions. But what EPA did is set a, a set of rules that require facilities to reduce production or to subsidize increased use of other means. It was really sort of engaging in almost like central economic planning for the power industry. And the court found that if Congress had wanted that kind of role to be played by EPA, it would have done so far more expl explicitly. But decisions of that sort of vast economic and political significance need to be clearly delegated to an agency. The agency can't sort of uh, usurp that authority. Um, th that line of reasoning makes sense when you think about some of the privacy rulemaking topics, you know, things like using the use of data and it having disparate impact. That is not something that Congress has charged the FTC with writing rules on. As you think about the competition rulemaking, the FTC is talking about covenants not to compete and having them declared to be uh, unfair methods of competition. Same with how uh, independent contractors are classified as independent contractors. Again, not an area where the FTC has traditionally been charged with regulating and where there's really a, a vacuum of authority from Congress delegated to the FTC. You know, in addition to the major question doctrine, you've also got uh, arguments regarding the non-delegation doctrine. Whereas the major question says, you know, has Congress delegated this authority to the agency that the major, I'm sorry, the non-delegation doctrine says, Congress can't completely escape its responsibility to legislate. It, it, it can't just kick things over to the administrative agency with little or no guidance. So um, that one's not at the Supreme Court yet, but there's um, certainly reason to think that the, the court would uh, be somewhat sympathetic to that. I think it will depend on, on the rule and the agency. We are just about out of time. I want to remind everybody of uh, the CLE password, which is rulemaking 2022. We are actually over time. I apologize. Um, I want to thank Mike and Mary for their uh, great job today. It looks like there's a question or two. We will circle back with the folks who, who posed questions and, and try and answer them to the extent we can. We thank you all for, for joining us today and hope you enjoy the rest of your week and the upcoming weekend. Thank you all.